Hello, congregation. Once again, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 this time. Matthew 6. And we will read verses 9 through 15. Matthew 6, verses 9 through 15. This is found on page 1498. Jesus here teaching the Lord's Prayer says, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly your Father forgive your trespasses. Well, congregation, as we've noted before in this series, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus isn't merely teaching us how to pray, but he's also teaching us how to live the Christian life. And now as we turn here to the fifth petition, we see that Jesus is teaching us the vital importance of forgiveness in the Christian life. Jesus is saying forgiveness has an essential place in the Christian's life. And so children, in our text, you can imagine Jesus holding up for us a a picture. So here's a picture frame. And and in the picture frame is a picture of a true Christian. And and you see the, the portrait of the Christian there. And above the Christian's head is this big arrow. And in that arrow, it's written, forgiveness. But then as you look at the picture, you notice that not only is there an arrow above his head coming down, but also there are arrows, one going this way, one going that way, going horizontally outwards. And both those arrows also say, forgiveness. Beloved, that's the picture of a Christian, Jesus is saying you simply can't picture a Christian without these arrows of forgiveness. Forgiveness is essential, and it flows in two directions. First, the vertical from God to them, forgiven by God, and then the horizontal forgiving of others. So that's what we want to see this afternoon. Our title is simply, Forgive Us Our Debts, and we have Two points. First, forgive us. And second, forgiving others. Forgive us our debts. First of all, forgive us. Matthew 6, 12, Jesus says, pray this way, forgive us our debts. And the first thing we want to see here then is the necessity. Here's the point. We need God to forgive us. We need it. This is a necessity. Notice as Jesus is teaching his disciples here, remember, he's teaching them the basics of prayer. Uh, Let me give you prayer 101. Here's the ABCs of prayer. And he's saying, don't forget this petition. If you want to learn how to pray, you need to remember this one. Forgive us our debts. Let's start with that word then, debts. This is, of course, a financial term, a money term. Children, maybe... At home, you have a little bit of money. Maybe you have a little piggy bank or or a jar. You're dropping some coins in there every once in a while. You have some money. Well, it doesn't take long to realize it's not nice to go into debt. When you're in debt, it means you owe somebody else money. You have a responsibility to pay them back. Maybe someone loaned you some money. They gave you some money, and it wasn't a gift. It was a loan. Pay me back, and you went, and maybe you spent your money. Now you're in debt. Five dollars. I owe someone five dollars. It's not nice to be in debt. Well, notice Jesus uses this picture and applies it to our spiritual life. In fact, Luke 11, verse 4, the parallel passage on the Lord's Prayer, 
clarifies what we're talking about. There it says, forgive us our sins. So that word is interchangeable here with debts. And so what a striking picture, though, we get for our sin. They're they're like debts. Through our sin, we've failed to give to God what's owed to him. What do we owe to God? Everything. What has God given us? Everything. And so what do we owe to God? Everything. He's given everything to us for this purpose, that we might use it for his glory. He's the creator. All things are made by him, through him, for him. And it's the for him part that says we owe him everything. He made us for his worship. Psalm 29 verse 2. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Give unto the Lord. Give it. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. He's worthy of it. He deserves it. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The chief end of man or the number one purpose for for humanity's existence is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So there's our problem. We don't. We're in debt. We don't give him the glory due his name. We we could expand this. We owe him thanksgiving. All the commands to give thanks, and often we don't give it. Uh, We owe him perfect obedience, and often we don't give it. We owe him our love, and often we don't give it. And so, friends, you see, debt has piled up. Spiritual debt has piled up in our spiritual accounts. Massive debt. Uh, Let's not be confused. Jesus doesn't want us confused. That's why we read Matthew 18, because there it's very clear. Matthew 18, 24, Jesus shows us this is a massive debt. Matthew 18, 24, and when the king had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. People in his day, when Jesus told this parable, would have uh, gasped in horror or laughed in disbelief because that number is huge. It's billions and billions of dollars in our terms. In verse 25 of Matthew 18, he was not able to pay. That's the whole point. He was not able to pay. The spiritual debts, friends, that we have incurred against God are beyond our ability to pay. And so if your view of of your sin is any less than that, as if maybe I can still pay this back, you haven't yet understood your sin. Beyond our ability to pay. Do you know this about yourself? Have you come to grips with that there's no chance, no chance, I could ever pay back God for the countless ways I've fallen short of his glory. Just, just think of someone financially. Again, this is the picture Jesus is using, financial. So you can picture someone, they have a little debt. We talked about being in debt, $5. Okay, so $5 debt, you know, if the child works hard enough, you know, get a little allowance maybe, do the chores. If they work hard enough, save enough, they can pay that off. No problem. Five bucks. But there are other cases where people are in debt so much that they have to come to grips with the fact I will never in my lifetime be able to pay this back no matter how hard I work, no matter how much I save, my debt, my financial debt is just too big. Now picture that person and that person now realizing that, like the gut feeling that they've gotten as as they come to grips with this and now they have to go make the phone call and go meet the person who they're indebted to. That's what Jesus is saying our debts are like. Never able to pay back. It's an incredibly hard realization. And yet Christ is saying, don't miss this point, Christ is saying the Christian, the true Christian has come to realize that. They have this this self-awareness. By the Spirit's grace, they know something then of their spiritual debt. Listen to how our catechism explains this. 
It says in this petition, we are praying, do not impute, that, that word impute, it just means do not hold to our account. So again, it's, it's a financial term. Don't hold it to my account. Do not impute to us poor sinners our transgressions. And so do you hear the self-awareness that, that the catechism has? The Christian knows himself as a poor sinner. Poor sinner. Matthew 5, earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who know their spiritual poverty. That's the point there. Naturally, we are all like the, the rich young ruler who think we are spiritually rich. God, we have things to offer you. Be impressed. And it's the work of the Spirit to humble us, to make us poor in spirit, to realize we don't have anything to offer. All we have is debt. We are spiritual beggars. We saw that this morning in Manasseh, didn't we? He came to that point. He saw it for himself. He was humbled. He knew of his poverty. But this is true of the Christian. This, you, you go through the Psalms and, and you find this in David. We, saw, we sung Psalm 32. Why is he saying, happy, blessed is the man whose sins, whose trespasses have been forgiven? Why is he rejoicing? He knows he can't pay this back. Read Psalm 51. He knows he can't pay this back. Or think of Paul in the New Testament. This isn't just an Old Testament thing. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. Paul speaks to himself as the chief of sinners. He's right there, head of the pile, chief of sinners. That's the Christian self awareness. And so, friend, is that your self awareness? We're looking at the portrait of a Christian. Jesus says the Christian has this self-awareness. Left to myself, spiritually poor. And it's not merely because of their past sins, sins of youth, but it's also because of the fact that they are daily debtors. The Christian has that awareness as well. I'm a daily debtor, meaning every day, even after grace, Every day, there's, there's fresh debts that I've incurred, new sins that I've committed. And so, beloved, this is striking. Uh, we don't want to miss this. Jesus, he doesn't expect his people to just go, we, we've talked about the Father, we're praying to a Father, and we have a good Father. All of that is, is so beautifully true. We started there. That's the doorway into this prayer. But notice this, Jesus doesn't want his people to lose sight of their debts, to act as if they don't have debts. Sometimes we can slip into that maybe. I have a good father, no debts. I haven't sinned against it. No, Jesus says, you have a good father, see your debts. See your debts. Notice that important little word that begins this petition, and. You see that in verse 12? And forgive us our debts. And that little word, it actually links it back to the petition that came before. There, we were praying for our daily bread. And, and Jesus said, uh, when we pray for our daily bread, we're praying for our daily necessities, the basics of life, things that keep us alive. And now Jesus links this petition with that one where we're praying for our daily bread. Now he says, and pray, forgive us our debts, meaning this is a daily occurrence. Just as much as we need daily bread, we need our daily debts forgiven. The Christian. And the Christian is more and more becoming aware of that. They see it. And so friend, when you pause to pray, do you bring to mind your debts? Jesus assumes we will. He assumes we'll try to keep short accounts with God. Meaning I don't want it to go, you know, days and days and weeks and months. If I have, you can go to God like David did after months and receive forgiveness. But that's not a model for us to, to live denying our debts. The model is, is each day, Lord, what, to examine, Lord, what are the debts? What are the sins? Search me, O oh God, how, that I might keep short accounts with you, that I might bring them into your sight. So once they're in mind, once these debts are in mind, what should we do? Well, we've already alluded to it. Should we stop praying? No. Should we sigh in defeat? No. I mean, we might be tempted to do that. Imagine having to go back to the bank every day and say, sorry, I have more debt I can't pay back. 
At first, that's embarrassing, but before long, it's going to lead you into serious trouble. And so you might want to avoid those calls, not pick up the phone when the bank's on the line, stop talking to them. Is that what we should do with God? We see our debts? No. No. We go to him in prayer. Bring them. And so, beloved, what do you do with your sins? That's the question Jesus wants us to ask. He's he's wanting to help us to deal with our sins. So what do you do with your daily sins, your old habits, the the sins that, that aggravate you because they're still there, the anger that keeps coming back? What do you do with it? How do you respond when when you feel guilty or when you know you've done wrong? Do you try to manage it yourself? Do you try to cover it up? Jesus says, see your sin, bring them quickly to God and ask for forgiveness. Do you see that's the key word here? That's the key word. Forgive us. Lord, release us. Free us from the debts we owe you, like like the beggar going back to the bank. I have these debts. Release us. Free us completely. Do you pray like that? Do do you go to God and, and, and ask him for complete forgiveness? He wants you to. That's what he's saying here. And he wants you to have assurance when you do as well. This takes us to the second thing out of the first point, the means The means, and here we're looking at how God forgives us. How God forgives us, the means. And the question we're asking is, can we be certain that there is forgiveness for debtors? Okay, Jesus, you want us to see our debts, you want us to go to to God with the debts, asking for forgiveness, but can we be certain? Can I have assurance that there is forgiveness? Well, I could point you to more examples than Manasseh, I could point you to Rahab, I could point you to Zacchaeus. Uh, There's so many illustrations that this is the case. But let me show you from the lips of Jesus himself that that he wants us to not only pray this petition, but to pray it with assurance that there truly is forgiveness. And I want you to see how costly this petition is to Jesus. Because when Jesus says, ask the Father to forgive your debts, he knows full well what that means. Uh, Turn with me, if you're able, to the end of Matthew's gospel, uh, Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Here it's the night of Christ's betrayal. And Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper. And notice Matthew 26 When you get to verse 27, it says, Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Why? For the remission of sins. Do you see that? Jesus knows there's no forgiveness without the sacrificial blood of the lamb. There's no forgiveness without the lamb spilling his blood to make an atonement for those sins. Uh, Sins must be paid for. The wages of sin is death. And so death is owed. God's justice demands it. But Jesus also knows that a substitute can take the sinner's place. He's designed this plan of salvation with the Father and the Spirit, after all. And so he lived with that conscious awareness that he is the Lamb of God who's come up to take away the sins of the world. And now here he is, hours before, he'll hang on the cross, and he says, here's the cup. Here's the cup. See the red wine and think of my blood, which is shed It's it's poured out for this great purpose that sins might be forgiven. Sins of all of my people from the the earliest days when you read in Genesis, all the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, all the way to the end of time of history, my blood needs to be shed so that sins might be forgiven. 
And so, beloved, what's your assurance? That when you go to God asking for forgiveness, that it's real? Here it is. This is it right here. When Jesus gave us the petition, he knew the perfection of his sacrifice, and he wants you to know it too. When Jesus told you to pray this way, he knew it would be pleasing to the Father, his sacrifice, and that it would be acceptable in his sight. He knew that he would take your place, child of God, on the cross to endure God's wrath on your account so that you could say, do not impute to me, God, my own trespasses, but impute them to him. Impute them to the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, the one who was stricken for our transgressions. He knew all of this when he gave this instruction to go to our Father for daily forgiveness. And so, child of God, are you going? Jesus, he bought for you the ability to go to the Father each day and say, Lord, forgive me. There's new debts. And to know that as soon as you say amen, they're dealt with, released, forgiven. And he wants you to have assurance of it. 1 John 1 verse 8 says this, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So don't go about denying your debts. But, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Child of God, that's God's promise that's been secured for you through the blood of Christ. He's bought this promise with his blood. And so it's true, it's real. Now, child of God, don't think that you're praying to the Father who is angry with us, but who will only put up with us because Jesus is interceding. Do you pray that way sometimes? The Father's angry with me, but, but, but Jesus is interceding, and, and, and so now, now maybe the Father will put up with me. That's a wrong view. The triune God works together, all three persons in his salvation. And so we are praying to the Father who so loved us in eternity when we were unlovable that he chose us for himself and who also chose to give us a mediator, an intercessor, Jesus Christ. This was the Father's choice that we might be able to come to the Father. So it's a loving Father and a loving mediator, a loving high priest who, yes, makes it possible for us to enter his presence. Oh, how the Father loves to forgive his people. Micah 7, verse 18, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Children, in these days when that was written, the worst place to drop something was when you're out on the boat, on the Mediterranean, you're holding something valuable, and oh no, it just slipped over the edge of the ship because you're never getting that back. And that's what God wants us to know about our sin. He's not bringing it back. It's been dealt with. It's been dropped into the depths of the sea. And so that's the great promise. All our sins cast out of the sight, out of his sight forever. And beloved, this promise takes us to an important distinction because we must remember that we are, that legally we are justified once. That is, in the sight of heaven, in the sight of the law, the law court of heaven, our past present and future sins are legally dealt with just one time. The moment we believe in Jesus Christ and we are declared righteous. And so when we pray this, we're not asking to be re-justified. No, that legal position never changes. The moment we believe in Jesus, we are forever righteous in his sight. And so why should we pray this? This is not about our legal standing, but it's about our relationship with the Father. Relationally, our sins hide the enjoyment of his face from us. 
Yes, he always remains our father, but we ask for forgiveness to restore to us the joy and the experiences of those, that joy of our salvation and to keep those short accounts with God. And so what an awesome thing it is to be a Christian. Uh, Benjamin Warfield, the great theologian of Princeton, said, wrote this, and listen to this. He says, we are sinners, speaking of the Christian, we are sinners and we know ourselves to be sinners, lost and helpless in ourselves, but we are saved sinners. And it is our salvation which gives the tone to our life, a tone of joy which swells in exact proportion to the sense we have of how little we deserve it. For it is he to whom much is forgiven who loves much and who loving much rejoices much. Is that the tone of your Christian life, child of God? Forgiven much? That changes the way then you ought, then the, that you relate then to others. This takes us to our second and final point. Forgiving others. Forgiving others. Notice again the petition. Jesus says, pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now this is, this is shocking language. Uh, Jesus calls us to bring to mind whenever we pray for forgiveness with God, which should be daily, Lord, forgive me my daily sins. He's calling us to bring to mind our relationships with others. He's saying, I don't want you to separate the two. I I want you to see the vital link between the two. There's a connection. Now, what is that connection? Well, this takes us to the first thing here again. It's the necessity. Of for, it's the necessity. The necessity. We need to forgive others. That's the point. We need to forgive others. Uh, if I have been forgiven, then I must be a forgiving person. What's the relationship of these two? Well, if we just read these few passages that we have, isolated from the rest of Scripture, we might think that our forgiveness by God, God forgiving us, is dependent on our forgiving others. We might think that. It it, it sounds, on the surface, in various places, like, I need to first forgive someone else, and then I will be forgiven. And yet, when we see the whole of Scripture, we know that's not the case. We know that we are freely forgiven. The sinner, like Manasseh, looks to the Lord, and they're saved. They are pardoned. Jesus teaches the same. This is why he can go to Zacchaeus, evil, wicked Zacchaeus, and offer him complete forgiveness before Zacchaeus has done anything else. But why is Jesus using this language then? What's his point here? Why is it forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors? Well, Jesus wants to highlight here the power of God's forgiving grace. He's wanting us to see that if we have tasted of God's forgiveness, then necessarily we will become forgiving people. His spirit will live in us and begin to change us so that what we've tasted vertically will start to spill over horizontally. And this prayer then becomes a prompt for us, a help, a means for us to live up to what we are as Christians. Because maybe, if you're like me, you go to pray, Lord, forgive me, my debts. And then I have to add, as I forgive my debtors, and as I have to add that, I realize, wait, I'm nursing a grudge against this person or this one. And you see then that this petition then becomes a means of grace because it's raising for me the inconsistency of my life. That if I would be dependent on God for him to release me from my sin, and yet here I am holding others in bondage to me. And so Jesus in his kindness gives us a petition that that pricks us, that helps us to live out the Christian life. And this is the whole point of his parable in Matthew 18 where the servant has been forgiven the massive amount, but then he refuses to forgive the other. You get this terrifying statement that the king makes in verse 32. Then his master, after he called him, said to him, you wicked servant, 
I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? That's what the Christian should hear each day in their ears. Should I not also have compassion? Should I not also have compassion? Should I not also have compassion? If my whole existence, my whole spiritual life is based on God's compassion towards me, should I not also have compassion? Well, what does forgiving others mean? Uh, It's not that consequences are removed. There are still consequences of sin. So for example, parents, if, if you're young person, if they're learning to drive and, and they've got their license now and they come up to you and, and they say, mom, dad, can I have the keys to the new car? Yes, okay, you know, here's the rules, be responsible, absolutely, okay. So they take the car out and they go and drive like a maniac and they get arrested for doing 50 kilometers over and the car is impounded. Should there be consequences? Absolutely, yes, to save their life. But you can forgive them, do forgive them and yet they feel the consequences. And it's not that we lose all discernment. In that case, do you just quickly give them the keys again the next time they ask? I hope not. No, we don't lose discernment. Trust needs to be restored and earned back. But what is this forgiveness? Well, it's a supernatural choice. And when I use supernatural, I mean we need God's help to make this choice, and the Christian has the Spirit. It's a supernatural choice to reflect my heavenly father and release the debt that someone owes to me. And notice the emphasis there. It's not on the feelings of forgiveness. Because I can still feel angry that this has happened and that I've been wronged. And yet in that moment, I'm still called to make a choice. And by God's grace, over time, those feelings We'll come back, the feelings of forgiveness. But forgiveness is, first of all, a choice to reflect my heavenly father. If we're claiming to be a Christian, Jesus is clear, we need to be ready to forgive all who've sinned against us. It's that simple and that hard. Now, we need to be ready to forgive. That means our hearts need to be in a posture of forgiveness. And this begins in that heart level first. Uh, we, we need to, to work on our own hearts. And, and this then takes us to, to the second and final thing we want to see here, the means, practically, how we forgive others. How do we do this? This is hard. Forgiveness is hard. In fact, it's impossible for us apart from God's grace. Yet, if we are a Christian, God calls us to forgive others. And he gives us then also the moral resources necessary, namely the Spirit of God. But how practically can we do this? Well, here's a few things. First, remember how much you've been forgiven. That is the most powerful thing that will help you. Remember how much you've been forgiven. See the mountain of sin. Bring it to mind. This is why the Christian, one of the reasons why the Christian daily needs to preach the gospel to themselves. See the lengths God was willing to go in order to make forgiveness possible. See that he did not spare his own son, but sacrificed him so you might be forgiven. See that. Impress that upon your mind. But second, also trust that God is a just judge. Trust that God is a just judge. Because by forgiving this person, I'm not brushing their sin under the rug or making light of it. But I'm trusting that God is the just judge who will make all things right in the end. In fact, if you go to Romans 12 and you find Paul, the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit, giving us this command to not seek vengeance, but namely to forgive others, notice this is the point he makes. Remember, God says, vengeance is mine. And so you don't need to take it. God is a just uh, judge. Their sin will be judged. We don't need to feel like we have to take justice into our own hands. Either Christ, it will be judged on Christ on the cross, if they're a believer, or on the judgment day, a final reckoning. And so there can be a release there in our own hearts when we remember God is judge. And I'm called to forgive. Again, thirdly, don't wait for your feelings. 
Forgiveness starts with that choice, and it starts then with you making promises to yourself. I think CCEF has highlighted this really well, or Insight Biblical Counseling, they have courses that help if you're struggling with anger, bitterness, forgiveness, but, but they highlight this whole fact that, that it starts with making promises to yourself, first of all, in your own heart. Promises that, that you are resolving to release this person from their debt. Promises that then you won't bring it up with them after you've, you've forgiven them. Once you've said, I forgive you, and, and they've asked for that forgiveness, and it, it's, I'm not bringing it up with you. And it's also a promise that I won't dwell on it. Yes, it'll come to mind, the pain's happened for sure these thoughts will come back to mind but I'm not going to dwell on it I'm going to fight these thoughts I'm I'm making that promise when I extend forgiveness and as we forgive then slowly over time these feelings of forgiveness grow and fourth we can't miss it we act with the spear's power notice how our catechism put it it says also as we find this evidence of thy grace of your grace in us that we are fully determined wholeheartedly to forgive our neighbor. It's an evidence of God's grace in us. It's an evidence of the Spirit's work in us that, that we're able to forgive others. And so go forward in his strength, leaning upon him. And then fifthly, pray for them. Pray for them. Start praying for them. When I don't want to forgive, that person should become more frequently mentioned in my prayers. The Lord might help me to forgive them. Well, congregation, our relationship with God is based on him extending forgiveness to us. Our relationship with him flourishes when we daily ask for his forgiveness and we keep short accounts with him. And our relationship with him is evidenced when we more and more learn to extend this forgiveness to others. This is the picture. Do you see the picture of the Christian life? The arrow coming down forgiveness, the arrow going out forgiveness. Is that the picture of your life? May God make it so. Amen.